Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Jen Clark, and I'm a Senior Marketing Manager here at Surefire Social. Today, I'm joined by my team members, Steve Eastlack and Sashi Belamkanda, and we're extremely excited to welcome Mark Richardson, the renowned national speaker, author, and business growth strategist to the home improvement industry. And he's going to be leading our discussion on cracking the remodeling code to business. If you're joining us for your first Surefire Social webinar, please know that education is always a top priority for our team. From our inception, our goal has been to help businesses with local customers navigate the digital marketing world through coaching. And we aim to be a partner in digital marketing. We work hand in hand to ensure your success when you work with us. If you have any questions during today's presentation, you can enter them into the question box in your webinar control panel. That's the box on the right side of your screen. The team and I will be here behind the scenes, and we'll be answering any questions that you have, and we'll be, pam we'll be uh, passing them on to our panelists to address. You can test that right now by entering your location. Let us know where you're joining us from. Just enter that into the chat. Also, just in time for the holidays, we're giving away a Pixel C tablet to one of you lucky attendees. You do need to be present to win, so be sure to stay on throughout the presentation. Also, in the spirit of giving, we have a holiday gift for all of today's webinar attendees. Mark Richardson and the team here at Surefire Social have a copy of Mark's book, Fit to Grow, 12 Business Themes from Growth, and it's for everyone in the audience today. To get your copy, send your shipping address to marketing at surefiresocial.com. We're also offering a Google Chromecast to any of today's attendees who schedule a digital marketing consultation with us at Surefire. We'll be doing more on that at the end of the webinar. It's a real honor to have Mark back at Surefire Social Headquarters to host a webinar. Mark's a member of the NAHB Remodeling Hall of Fame. He's a fellow at Harvard University Joint Center for Housing Studies. He was named an Ernst & Young Entrepreneur of the Year for Construction and Real Estate. And he's presented to thousands of businesses and leaders across the country at top industry conferences. Mark's accomplishments also span into the digital space. He hosts a podcast for home improvement professionals. It's called Remodeling Mastery. And during his podcast, he offers his guidance on how businesses can position themselves for success. If you haven't been listening to podcasts yet, we can help you get started with Mark's. Just send us a little message in chat and uh, Steve will also be posting the link to Mark's podcast so you can listen in. For now, I'm going to pass things over to Mark. Mark, thanks for being our speaker today. Great. Thank you, Jen. Uh, and uh, thank you for all uh, those that joined us today. I think this is hopefully going to be a good investment of time for the next hour and very fruitful and a, certainly a good time of the year to... Uh, uh, you know, be focusing on on this 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 topic. Um, we titled this talk um, "Cracking the Remodeling Business Code," and you know, we titled it specifically that way because you know, at the end of the day, with the literally thousands of thousands of different remodeling businesses, there's so many different insights, so many different ways that things are done that. Uh, I'm going to attempt over the course of the hour to, you know, help you make some sense out of not only sort of what you have, what the best of the best folks are doing, but also what the future might in fact look like. So as you position, you can certainly be better. So three goals I, I, I want to outline first. Uh, one is uh, it's important to understand this business better. Uh, very few remodelers went to remodeling business school. Why? Because it doesn't exist. Uh, the majority of the remodeling community uh, actually got into the business because they had a passion or love for construction or design. Uh, and as a result of that, while they certainly learned through sort of the hard knocks, they didn't learn through education. So my first goal is I want you to have a better understanding of what business the industry is all about. Uh, the second is I want to help you take some inventory 
inventory of what you've been doing, what you are doing, how well you're doing it. You know, this time of the year is especially important to do that. You know, taking that inventory and then reflecting on certainly uh, the future. And that really is about the third goal, and that is how do you position you, how do you position your team, how do you position your product for the future? You know, the future, I think, of the modeling industry is probably changing in many cases faster than almost any other time, certainly in the last 40 years I've been involved in this business. So the structure of today's talk is I'm going to spend you know, the first probably third of the talk giving you very much of the overview about the business. You know, it's hard to crack the code in this business, quite frankly, unless you understand it. The second is I'm going to give you uh, some insights of what I think are some of the keys to success. You know, I have the opportunity, not only having been involved with one of the leading remodeling organizations in, in the country, but also for the last year working with 20, 30 other remodeling organizations, I sort of see the best of the best. So I get a chance, I think, to be able to share some of those keys to what not only is successful in the tough times, but certainly in the go-go times that we're in now. And then lastly, we're going to talk about and how to think about the future and certainly how to position your business. So the first element I want to talk about is the environment. You know, I'm a big believer that, you know, no matter what business you're in, if you're talking about the business out of context, out of appreciating what the environment is, it, it quite frankly is not as meaningful. And the reality is, you know, in the go-go times of 2004, 2005, quite frankly, it was hard not to be successful hard not to grow. During the recession, I think in many ways, just surviving through some of the uh, recession, many of the businesses should have felt a certain degree of pride. But the environment that we're in right now is really also different. You know, up at Harvard, we look at a lot of different indicators. As a matter of fact, I encourage you to read some of the Harvard data to keep a good pulse of what some of those indicators are. But as I sort of work with different folks and reflect on it, the following, I think, are some of the indicators that I keep an eye on that I think really show not only where, where you are and how you're doing, but also, I think, help you to understand better what 2017 and 2018 might look like. The first, I think, key indicator to keep an eye on as a remodeler is home appreciation. Now, needless to say, when we hit the wall in 2008 and we started to see the drop-off in appreciation in the homes, it sort of paralyzed your clients and homeowners. It may not have been because of their interest in doing project, but they were watching their home decline in value. Well, in 2011, only about two or three of the top 25 markets in the United States were increasing or appreciating. Within about a year and a half or two years, 2013, we found about 24 of the top 25 markets. And we continue to see that to be very solid. So needless to say, the first key indication out there is home appreciation. And that's not only up, but I think at least for the next year or two, it's probably pretty safe to say that it's going to be pretty solid. The second element, I think, which is a key indicator is interest rates. Now interest rates, we're starting to see a little bit of creep and a little bit of adjustment, but quite frankly, they've been held, held down, I think, a little bit artificially for a while anyway. But the bottom line is interest rates are still at very, very favorable rates, which is a positive indicator, I think, for the home improvement industry. Now what's also interesting is if you look at some of the uh, folks that are forecasting the other moves in terms of interest rates, it may have a little bit of effect on the new housing market in the latter part of 2017, maybe a little bit before that. But I would argue as a remodeler, just like you, I would argue that seeing a little bit of an uptick in interest rates also creates 
an element of urgency on the part of homeowners to get going. So right now, I think for all practical purposes, interest rates are really quite positive. Another indicator that Harvard and certainly others in the industry like to keep an eye on is unemployment or the employment sort of dynamic. Now, needless to say, even in the worst of times, eight out of 10 people had a job. So it wasn't so much about it completely falling apart in terms of your clients, but unemployment is especially important because it creates confidence. You know, when unemployment is low, it's more about your clients feeling that they're gonna have a job six months, a year from now, not so much having a job today. And that confidence is what helps to breathe, I think, their, their desire to get out and do something. Another indicator that you don't keep an eye on as much, but definitely has an effect, I think, in the overall perception of things, and that is the number of houses that were underwater. You know, in the top or the peak times, about two million homes in the United States were underwater. In other words, there was more money owed than the value of the home. That started to creep up, and now it's less than half of that in the United States, which again creates a nice volume of homes coming into the market that potentially has not only the confidence, but also needs to be renovated, and the pent-up demand there should release and certainly create a more positive uh, dynamic. The stock market. Now, when I'm doing talks with different audiences, I oftentimes ask, you know, how many of you in the audience want to go out and dump some money tomorrow if I gave you a little bucket of money into the stock market? And the majority of the folks, I think, still tend to be a little bit skittish. But the bottom line, the stock market has gone up almost 300% in the last period of time since the stock market crash. So I think by having the stock market hitting almost record highs or record highs right now, whether you agree or disagree in terms of the dynamic of the stock market, it's at least an indicator of, of confidence in, in terms of feeling good about being able to invest money. A lot of these parts and pieces come together and they really bring what I think remodelers oftentimes have their ear to the ground the best, and that's the consumer confidence. At the end of the day, your biggest competitor is, in fact, consumer confidence. And when you sort of summarize, you look at home appreciation, up, interest rates, up or good, unemployment, up, houses underwater getting better, up, stock market being up, I think when you look at all those sort of stars and planets out there, they at least create an environment that 2007, 16 certainly is ending strong, and 2017 I think is, is certainly a great indication. I was just with uh, a couple of weeks ago a group of remodeling thought leaders, the best of the best, and the majority of them were experiencing not only double-digit growth in 2016, but they were also seeing the same dynamic as they move into 2017 as well. And I only share these parts and pieces because at the end of the day, you have to have the right conviction if you want to be looking at your business the right way. Should I grow? Should I hunker down? Should I remain flat? You know, these are all decisions that are personal and you have to make, but I think it's important at least to know what is the environment and what are the headwinds out there that will keep me from being successful. So as you also think about, you know, your company, as you think about other companies out there, you know, I always like to create sort of a little bit of a dichotomy between things. You know, what is a good company? Because I think most of you listening to this would consider yourself probably a good company, but I also think, if not anything else out of pride, you want to take your company to the next level and be great. So let me just run down through a few things uh, that I think will help you, I think, look at this dichotomy or, or, or parallel. The first is the good companies, I think they actually are still looking at change as an option. Should I do what I've always done or should I change? The great one, they do not believe it's an option. Change is an integral part of their thinking. 
Every day they're looking for better and adjustments. They're looking at sort of the marketplace. You know, one of the keys to some of the technology and some of the digital marketing efforts that the folks at Surefire are doing is keeping a really clear pace on the data and how things are changing in terms of the client and the environment. Another element that I see, the good companies, I think, for the most part, have a decent or good culture. However, the great ones have great culture. You know, Jim Collins said, you know, culture eats strategy for lunch. You know, think about that little quote. You know, at the end of the day, I think we have a tendency, especially as leaders, to be much more focused on data and analysis and all this, but we oftentimes forget about the fundamental culture and the glue that holds the parts and pieces. The great ones, great culture is a priority. The good ones, project focus. They think their business is all about doing remodeling. It's all about being focused on doing the remodeling project better. How the great ones are client-centric focus. You know, client-centric focus means that when production arrives to the project, they're not thinking about their tools or the pile of lumber. They're thinking about the client. They're thinking about how can I have a great experience for that client that morning and that day. The more client centrics that you can integrate into what you are, that is oftentimes one of the differences between the good ones and the great ones. The good ones have a good team. The great ones have an aligned team. They're not just good. They're not just talented. They're not just motivated, but they're aligned with each other. You know, think about a rowing crew. They're all rowing together, aligned in such a way that they're going to achieve synergistically much greater results. The good ones have satisfied clients. However, the great ones, they're raving fans. And a friend of mine even referred to the great ones have rabid fans for, for clients. And I think when you think about that, are your clients really raving fans or are they satisfied? You know, when you go to a restaurant and the maitre d' comes up to you and says, were you satisfied with your meal? Most of us, because we just want to move on, we said, yes, it was fine. We were satisfied. But is that a guarantee to come back? Of course not. And I think the, the great companies out there make it a top priority that it's not okay to be satisfied. You've got to have a raving fan. And the last element, and certainly not the least, and there's others as well, is I think the good ones are sitting back watching what's happening. Whereas I think the great ones are out there, they put their stake in the sand, and they're great because they're making it happen in their own sort of way. And I think you more that I think this webinar is a good example of this. The fact that you're listening, I think, to this particular session, I think is one of those little action moves to making it happen, and I certainly applaud that. So it's important, I think, and again, in our goal of understanding this industry, to understand, you know, is this industry a fruit or vegetable? Is it retail or is it wholesale? What the heck, heck do we have here in terms of what I do? You know, many, many years ago, I was actually working with Anderson Windows on trying to understand a little bit more the makeup of the industry. And what was interesting, they were looking at who the remodeler is in through different lenses and, and, and very differently than certainly other competitors. You know, interestingly enough, I then a couple of months later had conversations with the folks at DuPont who were developing some market strategies for the remodeling industry, and they were calling the remodeler a different name than Anderson was. So as a result of this, I actually spent some time trying to make some sense out of this, and this was actually then published with Remodeling Futures at Harvard of the industry makeup. So I want to walk you through a little bit more of what this is and sort of what it means. There are two primary verticals when you think about the remodeling industry. You have your specialty vertical, then you have your full service vertical. You also have outliers like insurance restoration. Now within the specialty vertical, as you can see from this slide, you have three primary columns. You have your big three, which are window siding and roofing. You have the rooms, kitchen, baths, basement, etc., decks. And then you have the subsets, 
like gutters and glass and garage doors. So within that, you have a lot of different companies that are formed. Now, if you look at the horizontals on the far left, the companies that vary within this group are the sizes of the companies. You have the very small companies, the medium, the little bit larger, and then the largest of the remodeling community. Similarly, within the full service, you have also three columns there. You have your smaller projects, your traditional remodeler, and then you have your design build. The X's in this case represent four manufacturers, sort of where the sweet spots are. Now, what does this mean, I think, to you if you're a remodeler? Quite frankly, not much, because if you just know who you are and what you're doing and what you're all about, it doesn't really matter. However, it is good to know how you fit into the puzzle piece of the remodeling industry and the makeup. The next slide I want to talk a little bit about is sort of this, this theme that I've talked about for many years, and that's construction categories are not created equal. You know, oftentimes construction and remodeling even, we throw it into one bucket and we say, how's the market doing? You know, how are we doing in terms of the ups and downs? This little graphic, I think, helps you to understand, I think, a little bit better on the, the ups and downs in the industry. And most of you who have been in the industry have experienced some ups or good times and certainly tougher times. The best way I think to look at this <clears throat> is in terms of the cycles. Now, Harvard used to think that new construction and home remodeling were counter-cyclical to each other. I think now that there's more than 40 years of data, we know the cycles are the same. However, the peaks or the level of peaks in the valleys are different. So let me try to explain this. New construction, as I think you probably know, has very high peaks and very low valleys. Matter of fact, at 2007, 2008 sort of time frame, we saw that drop off about 75%. I mean, think about your business in that industry, new construction dropping off 75%. Huge peaks and valley. Completely changed, I think, the makeup of a lot of the new homes and custom home market. Design build has peaks and valleys, but not as severe as new construction. Most of your big, better design built firms dropped off pretty dramatically during the recession. Some as many as 30, 40%, and thankfully most of them are at or above their recessionary lows or, recession, or pre-recessionary highs. Kitchens and baths has peaks and valleys. However, many of the businesses are more gravitating to kitchens and baths for many reasons, not the least of which is kitchens and baths are not only here to stay, but the life cycle from a homeowner's perspective of the renovation of a kitchen and bath has shortened pretty dramatically. 30 years ago, the life cycle of a kitchen and bath was 20 to 30 years. Now the life cycle, average life cycles, are more like 10 to 15 years, and as a result, there's not only a lot more bathrooms in the home, but there's also a lot more turnover in terms of those changes in the kitchen and bath market. Needless to say, the more maintenance type projects, the smaller type projects, handyman type projects, tend to be more stable. However, some of the bigger handyman type firms dropped off pretty dramatically because of the influx of many of the new construction workers getting into that market pretty easily. So, the point of this slide, in the spirit of you understanding your business a little bit better, is as you sit back and reflect on this, I think you can understand not only where we are right now, and certainly we're up in an uptime, not a downtime, but also understand some of the differences. Another interesting slide I pulled from a Harvard presentation really also shows some of the differences in terms of some of the growth of some of the different categories kitchen and bath, design build, insurance and, and exterior replacement. Now this is going to vary depending on the period of times and the cycles. So the point of this is don't just ask a question at an event, how are you doing, and just assume that what they're experiencing, you're experiencing should be the same. 
It could be the particular uh, uh, a particular segment of the market that they're in. So let's talk just about some of the key business considerations. As you reflect back on your business, many of these businesses, they have different considerations, different criteria that make them who they are. So one of them is client demographics. You know, it could be the age of the client, it could be the wealth of the client, it could be the location of the client, it could be the demographics itself. Another business consideration, is it a specialty business versus full service, as I talked about on the previous slide. Another one is tied into the size of the business or the owner's role. Is it a more of a practice, which is dependent pretty much fully on the owner, or more of a business that the owner can sort of step back? Many practice owners, they yearn to be more businesses, but you need to know how to be able to do that, otherwise you'll never achieve it. Another consideration is do you have more of a showroom or an in-home kind of sales type model? You know, it's really a distinctive different model in terms of how, and certainly some, have a hybrid. There's a third that is cropping up in this category, which is more of an online model. There's some businesses out there that are actually doing business, selling business as an interactive process online with clients, and certainly I think you can learn more about that process as well. Another consideration is how you're producing it. Some businesses are pretty much totally subcontracted. Some believe very strongly on owning and controlling the actual labor. Size and types of projects certainly is a business consideration. The lead generation methods, whether it's more marketing, heavy marketing, digital marketing, or whether it's more word of mouth. Certainly even the best of the best word of the mouth group in the past, I think, need to have the right kind of digital marketing efforts, I think, to be successful. You know, I actually read some insights from a survey that was done actually from Google today uh, uh, that I think are very, very interesting in the context of this lead generation, and that is today with these homeowner surveys, homeowners put more value on an online online survey or online result than they do a personal referral. And if you really think about that, that is a complete game changer for many businesses that believed in the past that all they need to do is focus on personal referrals and, and, and um, uh, past clients. Another element when it comes to consideration is the financing. You know, do you provide financing or not? Now, historically, most full-service businesses have not. However, some are cropping up and integrating more financing techniques into the process, whereas most of the specialty businesses that are the best of the best are pretty strong when it comes to this financing. Another one is the sales process. Is it one-sit relationship type sales processes? Then that's also different. And then the last element that I think is very different in terms of the consideration that I'm going to go a little bit more deeply on is the actual motivation of the owner themselves. So as you look back at this slide and reflect on this, and I would encourage you, if there's, a, if there's specific information that you're hearing, when you reach back to the Surefire folks who are producing and certainly supporting this, I'm sure that we can get you some of these slides and some of this information. But, you know, the owner's motivation in all this, I think, is critical. But if you look at this almost like a checklist, where do I fall? Who am I? What's my dialect? What's my language? You know, the more that you understand who you are and then you communicate that to the team, the more likely you're going to be successful. So next I want to talk about owner's motiv motivations. Now, for many, many years, I always thought, being involved in one business for over 30 years, that the motivation in business that certainly we had, or most had, was quite similar. The reality is, as I've gotten out and looked behind the curtain and gotten to know the best of the best out there, that the motivations of the owner is one of the fundamental whys between 
why some of these businesses are fundamentally different from each other, why some of them are bigger, why some of them are smaller. It's not the product and the service and also uh, often just the team, it's also the motivation itself. So I'm going to walk you through about seven motivations of what I see out there that you are probably a blend of these, but oftentimes you're one or two predominant of one or the other. And I think at the end of the day, you've got to look in the mirror and know who you are if you want to know what kind of business you're doing and how to crack the code for success. Some of the businesses look at what they have is a job. The reality is they lost a job and they needed a job, so that job was starting a business. They stepped in, they started to do little projects, stepped into the quicksand, started to do more projects, quicksand got up to the waist, they turned to their spouse or looked in the mirror and said, you know, I now I'm in the remodeling business. They got a job and they're just happy, quite frankly, that now they can control at least their destiny a little bit by having the job. And quite frankly, that's what creates fundamental joy and that's what their motivation is. The second motivation I see out there is more the entrepreneur. It's more the innovator. They're actually fired up more than anything, not by profit, not by having a job, but by getting out there and try chasing the next shiny object. They're more entrepreneurial spirit. They're very excitable and very interested in the next new thing, not necessarily just being better at the thing that they've created. The third that I see out there with some is that they're primary investors. Now, I'm not here to judge whether a person is one motivation or the other, but it's important that you know your motivation. I have a good friend that has a very successful remodeling business that looks at it as an investment. He looks at his people as almost rental properties that give him returns on investment. He looks at the cost involved of leads going into the business in a very tight way and what the return on those leads are. He's an investor and he looks for returns. And if he can get just as high a return by doing less in terms of number of projects or sizes of projects and given the profitability he wants, he's actually as or more excited about that. The fourth one that I want to talk about is it's a business. Now, a business is almost like a child. It has a life of its own. Some motivations, and certainly this was my primary vote motivation in terms of business, was that my joy and my fulfillment came as a result of the team's improvement, came as a result of doing better things for the client, as a collection of certainly the product improvement. At the end of the day, the business had a life of its own, and that was really what the motivation was all about. The next motivator, and this slide, by the way, was created about a year ago, uh, is ego. One of the motivations, certainly, that's out there, I think, is very much about ego. There are remodelers that are driven, in many cases, more by an award, more by being acknowledged, more by being on the cover of a magazine than necessarily having a great business. And again, who am I to judge that? However, if you wonder, for example, why maybe certain things are certain ways, it may not be because of the business or the investment or necessarily innovation. It may be the ego itself of the owner. Another motivation that I see out there is what I call the evangelist. You know, there are businesses out there that are that are, in fact, about a cause. In some cases, the cause is about the environment. In some cases, the cause is about, you know, certainly creating the right kind of culture for the community. In some cases, it even has religious connotations. I was reading this in a magazine recently about professional remodeler wrote about some of the causes or religious-based businesses that are out there. But at the end of the day, if that's what your motivation is, that's the way you need to think about in design. And the last motivation I see, which is actually a little bit different, 
but certainly predominant in the remodeling industry is the legacy. There's a tremendous amount of family businesses, but legacy is more than just family. Legacy is also about that next generation within your business. Many businesses are positioned and the decisions are made in large part not necessarily about today, but also about what the legacy is all about moving forward. So as you look at this slide, this is not intended to pick A, B, or one off of one column. For the most part, we're all a blend of some of these. However, just like in politics, you're much more to, uh, far to the left or far to the right. I think the more that you understand and you can actually convey what your motivations are to your team and to the client, the more successful you're going to be. So let's just talk about growth. You know, I think understanding growth is important. When you belly up to the bar at association meetings or different things, everybody's sort of talking about things through different voices, but also they're, they're speaking slightly different dialects when it comes to growth. So you can choose how you want to define growth, but there's many out there. Some people look at growth in terms of top line sales. Some people look at growth in terms of market share. You know, they believe if they have a higher percentage of the market share, it will get them through tougher times more effectively. Some people believe in the portfolio blend. You know, you want to look at how you're going to diversify your business and have the right kind of portfolio blend, just like an investment portfolio that has equities and bonds and cash and real estate. You know, what is that blend of growth that you want to see and keep in check when it comes to your business? Sometimes it's about team growth. You know, I see a lot of businesses out there that need to focus much more on the talent and the team as they're growing than necessarily just the top line. Some cases it's profitability growth. That's obviously one way to look at it. Certainly the client experience. And also it's important to how predictable and sustain, sustainable the results will be, which is a healthy way to look at it. You might also look at growth in terms of the number and the volume of your strategic alliances. You know, as you grow, I think the business at a very high scale, you certainly need to make that more of a priority and not be out there on islands by yourself. So as you're reflecting on it, 2017, how do you want to grow? Which one of these elements really sort of hits a nerve and chord for you? And how do you communicate that certainly to others? So one of the things I think it's important to think about in the spirit of all contractors are not created equal is the whole notion that business, businesses within the remodeling uh, industry and certainly community do fail. You know, this was actually a slide that was pulled from a, you know, a Harvard, that Harvard uh, uh, review or Harvard presentation that just shows, I think, the level of volatility. You know, needless to say, very small companies tend to fail much, much faster than the bigger companies. Are you communicating that to prospective employees out there? You know, certainly the stability is there. But I think what's important, I think, to understand, being such an easy entry business, uh, three out of five remodelers fail in five years. But what's interesting, about nine out of ten fail in ten years. So do not assume that if you hit that five, six, seven-year mark, you're sort of out of the woods. Matter of fact, I would say, based on some of the numbers and metrics out there, you might have just as much a difficult time moving forward until you pass that 10-year mark. So one question I oftentimes get, oftentimes get, is why do businesses fail? Why do divisions within businesses fail? And as I've reflected for many, many years on this subject and actually experienced some normal scars and bruises of any business owner, business entrepreneur, I think I've found at least there are three primary things that uh, are reason that these divisions tend to fail or not. Uh, the first one, and some of these are a little bit more sort of conceptual, but it's important you at least use them as a filter. The one reason is focus. You know, 
Losing focus will allow you to fail. You know, new businesses, new divisions are like children. They need a lot of focus. They need day-to-day -day attention. They need care and feeding that a mature element of a business or division doesn't necessarily need as much. The second is commitment. Many businesses are made up of teams. They're made up of partners. They're made up of family members. Oftentimes, when something is launched, whether it's a division or business, there's a level of commitment on everyone's part. However, that commitment does, in fact, change over time. If it changes or if that commitment wanes, it's likely that division, that child, will in fact fail. The third element is what I put under the category of the capital. Capital is the time, the money, the resources that you're putting into it. It could be corporate energy that you're putting into it. So you reflect on these three things. You can have the right commitment and the right level of focus, but if you're not giving it the fuel, the capital it needs to be successful, it can fail. You could be throwing a lot of money at it. However, if you're not having the right champion that's focused on the initiative, it could fail. So at the end of the day, what I'm more than anything trying to encourage with some kind words is don't let the child fail. Don't let the division die. And the best thing to do, I think, is make sure that each one of these, I think, boxes are checked off. So let's move into the part three here, which is so part two, and then the part three of some of the keys to success. You know, as I look at them, they're like puzzle pieces that hook together. You know, Henry Ford said, if you think you can or can't, you're right. You know, it all starts with the right mindset in business. You know, mindset has many elements. Positive attitude, work ethic, team sport. It also is the pace of business. So one of these puzzle pieces, I think, to be successful is you have to have the right mindset. As I look around at the best of the best, the owners, the leaders in those companies, they have the right mindset in business made of attitude, work ethic, synergistic, team sport mindset. The second is you need to be fundamentally fit. You know, I wrote this book, How Fit Is Your Business, and I encourage you either to go online and take a look at it if you don't already have the book, but it takes, I think, the, uh, the reader through a fitness checkup. And just like going to the doctor, you know, and getting your cholesterol and blood pressure checked, that's what this book does or allows you to do. But more importantly, you know, you have to think about your business in terms of the holistic fitness of the business, not just one category or the other. You know, you might have a lot of top line sales, but if you don't have the product in check, you're probably going to ultimately fail. It's very important that you get either all A's or all A's and B's and not necessarily have one of those scorecards pull you down. So the more I think you understand the fitness of your business, the more, the better you're going to be. The third element in these puzzle pieces is those businesses that understand that you've got to adjust and change. You know, if you're not adjusting and changing in your business, you're going to become irrelevant. You know, a friend of mine said from Detroit, Brian Elias, he said, you know, during the depression we or recession, we grew our businesses and we chose not to participate in the recession. They changed. They didn't want to become irrelevant. So if you look at this subject and sort of compare it over a period of time, this element of change, look back 10 years versus today, I think this really gives you, I think, the right feel. You know, 10 years ago, you just do it. Today, the client wants to discuss it. 10 years ago, clients willing to take risks. Today, they want balance risk. 10 years ago, clients would find you. Today, you need to have a pretty aggressive way to look at your marketing and get out and mine the data and find those clients. Ten years ago, high-touch marketing, today you've got to have an integral part of your strategy, high-tech marketing, otherwise you're going to be stumbling and potentially fail. In the past, your clients would follow the fantasy. 
Today, it's up to you as the voice of reason for the clients to control the fantasy. And in the past, you could focus on the what, where today you need to focus with your clients on how they go about buying remodeling. So one of my friends up at Harvard, and certainly actually the CEO of the largest remodeling organization in the country, over a billion dollar company, about five years ago, he said those companies that are focusing on mastering the labor, mastering the talent, are going to be most successful. And it really sort of hit a chord for me to the point that I've been watching very carefully some of the different companies out there. And if you want to be successful in these times, you've got to adapt the right sort of mentality when it comes to mastering the labor. So let's just look at, I think, some of the fundamental columns when it comes to mastering the labor, mastering the talent, mastering the people in your business. One is you've got to have a world-class culture. Second is you've got to know how to find the talent out there. You've got to start to become more of a magnet for the talent, not a net. You've got to know how to keep them. The best of the best companies, they track the retention of the key team members and of the A players, and they watch it and they nurture it very carefully. Training. You know, training's an investment, not an expense. I led a group not too long ago that actually discussed this subject, and the ones that grew dramatically during the recession actually invested more in training. The few companies that pulled back on training actually went down in terms of growth. And lastly, I think you need to think about your labor force as being more than just your immediate folks. It's also your strategic alliances. So one of the elements, I think, moving forward that you have to take into consideration is make sure that you have the right clients. You know, a friend of mine many, many years ago shared this 18% rule. And it's turned out, I think, as I've tested this over the last 20 years or so to be the case, and that is 18% of the homeowners out there will not allow you to make a profit, will not allow you to make a profit. And for those listening to this, if you can just imagine, if I can just eliminate some of those, if I can just have only 5% don't allow me to make a profit, you're going to see dramatic increases in terms of not only your stress, your team's performance, but also your profitability. So the following is sort of a checklist, and I'm going to walk you through this just real quickly, but if you look at these elements that are coming up on your screen, they really help you, I think, to understand this is what's required in terms of filtering and creating the right client. You have got to be more of a gatekeeper. You've got to ask these questions. You know, are the clients that you're working with honest? Do they make decisions effectively? You know, do they trust you? Do they value your professional advice? And the reality is if they don't, they're the wrong client. So you have to gracefully find a way to move on. So the last segment I want to touch on, and then we'll maybe have a minute or two to take your questions and have Jen wrap up, is about how you think about positioning your business for the future. And like many of the methodologies I think you're hearing today, you know, break it, your business, in terms of some parts. Think about your product. Think about your team. Think about the client. Think about the technologies. And also think about the strategic relationships. When you think about your business almost like holistically in terms of these parts and pieces, it really allows you to isolate and focus and improve on the right stuff. So I'm going to quickly break this apart for you. As you think about your product, is it easy for the client to buy? Is it really relevant to today's sort of terms? Are you focused just as much on the how they're buying, the process of how they're buying it, not just the what they're buying? Your team, do you have all A players on your team? Are you doing the right level of training? But more importantly, is the training effective, not just efficient? Are you seeing the returns on investment? And are you really looking at your team synergistically in terms of sort of a team sport? Your clients, 
Do you understand the data and the demographic when it comes to your clients? You know, this data is all out there for you. I think tapping into relationships like Surefire, you can actually mine and understand that data so much more effectively. Are your clients getting a world-class experience? Do you even know what that is? Try to isolate and articulate that. Are you able to keep your clients? You know, a misconception I think a, remod a lot of remodelers have is once I've done a project for a client, they're my client. The truth of the matter is 80% of them think it's just a transaction. You're just a transaction, not necessarily their sort of go-to person. So what you have to do is focus on how do I keep these clients for life? How do I continue to touch them? Technology. Are you investing the time and the money in the technology? You know, technology has revolutionized this industry. Are you keeping up with that? Are your technologies and what you're doing in terms of your strategies focused on benefits to the client? And do you really appreciate the level of reviews that are out there and the transparency? You know, your clients today know more about the products than you. They know more about the cost, but they even know more about you than you. Do you really know what they're saying? You know, it's so important, I think, to glean these insights when it comes to, I think, the technology and the digital marketing. But also don't forget about, I think, this strategic partnerships. You know, I think as the first thing I would encourage is change your dynamic and re your relationship with your manufacturer, with your supplier, with your di distributor, with your marketing firm, whoever it happens to be, your accounting firm, and start to look at them not as a vendor, but as a partner. And when you start to change that paradigm, you're going to start to see, I think, fruits of that relationship that are very different. Start to think about, support your associations. Start to think about them as allies in your community, not just competitors. And certainly leverage, I think, the different contractor programs. Because as I said at the beginning, you didn't go to Remodeling University. So leverage, I think, some of those com com programs that the manufacturers and the suppliers and certainly webinars like this as educational techniques. The last element, I think, when it comes to positioning for the future that's critical is focusing and looking in the mirror at yourself. And I say this not in any sort of sort of condescending way or being patronizing, but at the end of the day, as I talk about in my books, it's the leadership that makes great companies more than ever. You can be developed in terms of a great leader. But as you think about this, it all starts with you having the right mindset. You know, it's important that you are the voice of reason. You know, I just shared with you why you should be encouraged about the future. Are you encouraging your people and having the right positive mindset, the right work ethic, the right pace, the right synergistic thinking in your business? Are you a student of success? You know, what I've seen with the best of the best, matter of fact, I spoke to Rob Levin, one of the icons in this industry, literally last night, and he had questions and he was focused on improving himself. I mean, he's grown largest, some of the largest remodeling organizations in the country. He's truly a student of success. Are you a student of success? Very, very important question. Because success, at the end of the day, is a verb, not a noun. It's what you do with it that makes you successful, not that you're entitled to it. And then lastly, I think it's so important today, now that we're solidly out of the recession, to focus more on the long term, not just the short term. You know, start to stretch those muscles, those long term muscles, and not just those short term, in the trenches, day to day muscles that you've been doing. You know, spend in, as you get into the holidays, you know, 10, 15% of your time, not just looking at the first quarter, but looking out two, three years out there in terms of how you think about the business. So I want to close with more of this image that you're looking at here. And I've been talking about this subject and written on this subject. And as you know, I try to speak in metaphors, not to be clever, but more to try to communicate and have you fully understand things. 
I really look at your business in the industry as very much like an apple orchard. Back in 2004, 2005, we were in the go-go times. This orchard was abundant with apples. There were so many apples on the tree, they were falling on the ground. We actually didn't even have to reach up or climb up into the tree to get the apples. We were fat. We were happy. We were just shoveling these apples into the baskets in the easiest way. Then we got up into 2006, 2007, started to get a little bit more scarcity of apples on the ground. We actually had to stand up and pick them from the tree. Then we got into 2008, 2009, they weren't even pickable from standing on the ground. We had to go out and find this newfangled thing called a ladder. We had to climb up and we had to develop new techniques in terms of picking these apples that were up higher up in the tree, team kind of efforts. We had to deputize different people to help us be more successful. Then as we got up in through the recession at 2011, 2012, all of a sudden the buds started to come back. Now we're 2013 and we're sort of two or and, and beyond and we're certainly seeing some positive things. My point in this was there was a drought, but the fundamental apple orchards, the fundamental trees themselves were solid. We're solid then, solid now, and they'll be solid in the future. I think it's safe to say that homeowners are going to always need the remodeling community. It's safe to say that they're not going to get better at doing things themselves. They're not going to abandon their homes and move into caves. They're going to need the professional remodeler. And I share that with a little bit of passion because I think those that just can put the stake in the sand and get out there and focus on creating their own success by not being naive, by focusing on the facts and figures, by leveraging their relationships of the experts in these new changing times the more successful you're going to be. So I want to thank everybody and certainly thank Surefire for allowing me to be able to speak to you today. We've had a tremendous response in terms of those joining us today. And I really want to thank certainly, uh, as much as I would like to sell you my book, uh, I want to thank Surefire for offering up my book, you know, as certainly a gift and, and certainly encourage everybody to, to be able to take advantage of that. So I'm going to turn it back over to Jen. Thank you, Mark. Um, we're going to skip ahead. Just one slide here. Um, we're going to take a quick pause here for today's poll. As I mentioned earlier, we're offering a complimentary digital consultation for all of today's attendees. And for those who do get a consultation, you'll also be getting that really nice Google Chromecast you see on your screen. Um, Mark has been training the team here at Surefire to conduct a business fitness evaluation based on his best-selling book, Fit to Grow. So you're going to be getting the same types of insights that Mark discussed today. The, the evaluation is a one-on-one -on -one session. It allows you to take full advantage of everything Mark's been covering and sharing today and help you find out how you can create a robust web presence in 2017 and start generating predictable business next year. During this consult, our experts are going to help you identify some of the missed opportunities for business across your online presence, from social media to directories to reviews, and your website. So please take a moment here to answer the poll we've got launched on your screen. You can let us know if you'd like to have that one-on-one, -on -one, if you'd like a copy of today's presentation, or if you'd like both. And in just a minute, we're going to jump into some Q&A questions that we've got from our audience. And then we'll be announcing today's winner. OK. So our first webinar question comes from Dave. And Dave asks, does Mark think any particular categories will do better than general remodeling for 2017? Well, that's a great question. And, you know, I'm a big believer in sort of looking at the facts and figures and the data uh, uh, and not just sort of uh, the talent and, and, and the, the yearning. So I would say some categories I think that are going to do especially well 
we're seeing a big demographic shift with the over 65 community uh, in the marketplace. I think those that are dedicated to those aging in place or those older folks that truly want to live in their home and not be forced to move and have the right kind of marketing, the right kind of message for them, I think they're certainly a niche that's going to be especially effective. Um, you know, the insurance restoration industry has always been dependent on bad weather. So I certainly can't predict the weather, but if we've, we're going to have a, you know, a tough winter, then certainly I think that category will move up. Uh, I think for at least uh, 2017 and maybe even a little bit in 2018, I would say that the full service design build community will also do well because we're seeing the average tickets go up. But as we see interest rates creep up, uh, that might in fact be pushed down a little bit. Certainly, I think the specialty communities, uh, the window community, uh, certainly the roofing community, uh, they're going to do very, very well, I believe, in 2017 unless they are not competing, I think, with the latest and greatest sort of edges, so to speak, in terms of both marketing and, and, and sales strategies. Thank you, Mark. Uh, this next question comes from Heinz. Heinz asks, um, what's the outlook on the economy and consumer confidence for 2017? So I think he wants to get your perspective on that. Well, again, I don't have a, a, a crystal ball on it, so I just go by, you know, what some of my work at Harvard and, and, and all the folks that are much smarter than me sort of come up with. And when you look at the Lira, which is the leading indicator of modeling activity, uh, the forecast for 2017 is for, is for really good, solid growth. 16 was good. 17 is uh, going to be strong. Uh, one of the elements of the lira that they look at a little bit more carefully is interest rates, and at least uh, that's pulling down, I think, the remodeling numbers in the in the fourth quarter, maybe part of the third quarter a little bit. But uh, again, looking at it from a slightly different perspective, but that for the better remodelers, interest rates creeping up could help to create urgency to get the clients to move faster. So the bottom line, I'm expecting a very solid runway, very solid 2017, short of, you know, some sort of major catastrophe or event out there, it should be very good. Okay. Uh, this next question comes from Bella. Bella asks, is the market ready for a standalone universal design division under the design build company umbrella? You know, that that's a great question. Um, uh, the answer, uh, quite frankly, or the best answer that I, I'd want to say is it depends. Um, uh, you know, many design build firms that have diversified in the right kind of way, I think they can, in fact, have more of a aging in place, universal living kind of focus and specialty. However, I think a lot of it has to do with the scale of the client base. It's a very large client base that you can sort of feed off of. has a lot to do with the, uh, the demographics uh, of, the, uh, uh, of, of the area, the geography demographics of the area. Uh, does it match up to that? Um, but also it has a lot to do with, I think, the, the organization and the infrastructure itself. Because I think if the organization is really got their act together, really fit, uh, it's that a universal type uh, element in their business is not just a shiny object or a diversion to what they're really good at, then I think that they can be successful. So great question, but the real answer, it depends on a lot of things, not just, you know, generically yes or no. Okay, the next question comes from Joe. And Joe asks, can you diversify as a company? Well, over diversify. I'm sorry. Oh, over diversify. Absolutely, absolutely. Matter of fact, as you really think about, I think companies, um, 
some of the ones that are challenged, I think, some of the better companies out there, uh, I think if, if they're honest with themselves, they have over-diversified. Um, I don't think there's necessarily an exact rule of thumb other than the elements that you're putting together for your business uh, they have to be synergistic to each other, ideally. Uh, the team has to culturally uh, fit these different parts and pieces. Um, ideally, uh, it would be better diversify with the same client base. Uh, for example, insurance restoration can be tricky to weave into uh, traditional remodeling businesses because the client is different. Uh, so, uh, yes, you absolutely can over-diversify, but I am a big believer in diversification in large part because if you have all your eggs in one basket uh, and we hit the wall, which we will in the economy, uh, you're going to probably drop off pretty dramatically and it's that diversification, I think, that helps to create uh, more of a balanced portfolio that can help you be successful. All right. The next question comes from Bella. It's an interesting question. She says, I don't believe in the pay-to-play review sites like Yelp, but do rely on how is Facebook and Google, et cetera. In your opinion, is that perception a mistake? Well, that's probably, Bella, a great segue into me asking, asking Jen the answer to that, because while I certainly uh, know hows, I certainly know Yelp, I know the good, bad, and the ugly. Uh, you know, one of the expertise, I think, that uh, an organization that lives and breathes, you know, the, the technology and social media and, and digital sort of marketing, like Surefire, is really the kind of organization that you need to ask that question. Um, so I can't say pay-to-play is good or bad. What I can say is, uh, and I certainly would encourage you to be, uh, you know, at least forthright enough to act, ask an expert that really knows the answer to that question. So, Bella, we're going to follow up with you on that question and try to get you a really thorough answer. But in short, um, we are in full support of all of these platforms. Yelp is not just a pay-to-play platform. A lot of people use it just as a directory site. Same with Home Advisor, Angie's List now, um, and we've found a lot of our clients have had great results with them, and they're just a powerful way of communicating to Google that you are in a specific service area, you serve clients in that area, and um, people who live in that area can contact you. So it, it goes into account for your SEO and your ranking. Um, okay, so I wanted to announce our winner. We are getting some more questions, but I'm going to move over to that slide just so we let you all know. Kill the suspense for a minute. All right. Drum roll, drum roll please. <laughs> Today's lucky recipient of a Google Pixel C tablet is none other than Steven Silverman. Congratulations, Stephen. Please email marketing at surefiresocial.com with your full mailing address. We need all of your mailing information to send this. And we'll ship it right out to you just in time for the holidays. OK. So if we do have time for one more question, um, this is actually another question about advertising. So I think we're going to get back to you all on these advertising questions. And I think we can wrap things up for the day since we're, we're 10 minutes past the hour. All right. So I wanted to give a huge thanks to Mark for joining us today and to all of our attendees. Please do join us for more of our upcoming webinars. On December 20th, we'll have another Mark here. That's Mark Montini. And he's going to be coming here to present the most common mistakes made in local digital marketing. So all of you with marketing questions, be sure to check that out. Uh, for details on that and more, you can go to our website, surefiresocial.com. There's a link at the top of the home page for webinars. That's where you can register. And if you were napping during our poll, I'll mention one last time, we're offering Google Chromecast for all who are qualified. 
for a complimentary digital consultation with us. So please send an email to marketing at surefiresocial.com if you're interested. And to grab your copy of Mark's book, send your mailing address also to marketing at surefiresocial.com and we'll send you a copy of that book. Thanks again, everybody, and have a great afternoon. Thank you.